Welcome to The Power of One. This is a show that can show you that people make a difference every single day in this community and uplift some of the stories that you might not be aware of. The Power of One is something that's inside all of us and helps us to um, grow and develop the community that we live in. Today, I'm very, very pleased to have with us Paul Livingstone, musician, composer, uh, creator of the Soul Force Music Festival. And we want to find out a little bit about um, what inspires him, what motivates him, and what gets him to um, work on environmental issues through music. So thank you very much for being here today, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Happy to be here and uh, share a little bit about what I do and what we're doing in the community. So thank you. Great. So let's talk a little bit first about um, uh, where you came from, you know, uh, where you grew up and some of your experiences as a, a young person. Yeah, um, well, I was actually born in Lebanon, which is interesting because in Pasadena, most people uh, will assume I'm Armenian. I was born in Lebanon because there's such a distinct Armenian community here from Lebanon. And, uh, but um, I, my parents were traveling and doing work there. So in, I was born in Beirut, lived in Colorado, and then in Philadelphia before we moved out to California when I was 12. Mm. So um, since then, I've been uh, here in Pasadena, Altadena, and um, just, just love it. Uh, aside from spending uh, time in India, um, six trips, the first of which when I was 15, um, living in North India for a year mm. and beginning to study uh, Indian classical music, specifically sitar and tabla, which is the, uh, the drums. And sitar, of course, is the stringed instrument most popular, uh, popularized by the great uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar, um, who became my teacher uh, years later after hearing him in a concert here at PCC um, and meeting him. So, but how did that happen? I mean, I go to concerts all the time. I don't get to meet the, the performer, you know, like Beyonce's Good at the question. Rose Bowl. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have a chance <laughs> yeah. to go talk to her. So. Yeah, well, how that happened is uh, when I came back to Pasadena when I was 15, uh, I went to Muir, by the way, mm -hmm. and- um, That's okay, I went to Blair. <laughs> Uh, funny story about Muir is I, I, I was playing guitar uh, since I was a little kid and I, I used to show up at Muir with my guitar but without any shoes and they used to kick me out and send me home. Uh, Just for not wearing shoes? Yeah, it, yeah it, was, it was a great way to get out of school for a day <laughs> or at least a morning until my parents sent me back. But uh, yeah, went to Muir and then for ninth grade and then 10th grade, um, actually ninth and 10th and then 11th grade I went to India. Then no. I came back to Pasadena. So, um, so what were we talking about? Well, there? then the trip to India was uh, focused on music. The, oh yeah, the yeah, study of Shankar. music. And that, so, you know, so when I was Shankar. twelve, um, I was really into the Beatles. The Beatles were like pretty much all the music I listened to, especially mm -hmm. the late psychedelic era Beatles music, which I was crazy about. I wasn't a love you, love you too, uh, love me do kind of Beatles fan. Um, so I was listening to like Rubber Soul and Sgt. Peppers and um, you know Revolver, these kind of really experimental at the time and very mm. progressive records. And I heard the sitar and I was like, wow, that's a, that is such a cool sound I, and I wanted to find more. And then I found a, a Ravi Shankar record and uh, called The Genius of Ravi Shankar. I still have it on my wall. And I listened to this record with these big 70s headphones, and I, I was just transported uh, to this world of absolute creative creativity and uh, imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember keeping my eyes closed for 20 minutes, this 12-year-old kid, and listening to this music. And in India, they, they have a, a concept called darshan, which is... Uh, they use a lot in the context of spirituality where you've, you have this sense where God has given you a gift which uh, changes so, your life. But Tarshan is the gift? or Tarshan is the word for that, yeah, that, that blessing. Action. It's like mm -hmm. a blessing, you know, but it's something that shifts your consciousness or shifts your life in some way. 
So um, I like to think of it as that because it literally changed my life. Uh, mm -hmm. When I listened to that record, I opened my eyes. I decided that this is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. So uh, it was um, really but, a, a blessing. And then, and then I, I asked my father, hey, can you get me a sitar? Because I was already playing guitar every day and really into playing blues and rock and roll. Um, so three years later, I didn't get the sitar, but, but three years later, he, uh, I had this opportunity to go to India uh, and start learning the music. So mm -hmm. I went for a year. And uh, my parents supported me in that, which was a great blessing also. Yeah. So, and, and then I was just so happy to be living in, in, in India and learning this music for a year and coming back. Yeah, that's an extraordinary experience. I think every 15-year-old or 16-year-old should be going somewhere. Yes. Maybe not um, playing sitar in um, India, but um, Africa, Asia, yeah. um, exploring the world. So um, there's a, a part of what you're doing that's related to the environment. When was it that you were more um, aware of this relationship between music and the environment, or, or what what sparked you mm -hmm. to really try to, um, because we're, we're on the verge or on the edge of um, environmental degradation that yes. is uh, possibly we're not gonna be able to uh, reverse. So yes. how did that kind of evolve for you? Um, well, I think, I think growing up at Pasadena and Altadena and um, really spending a lot of time in the mountains really gave me an intimate connection with uh, nature and a respect for uh, creation mm -hmm. in that sense. And uh, when I was, I think, 14, I took my first, what, what I like to call vision quest, to use a kind of a indigenous concept or language. And I, I went up, I, I hiked to Mount Wilson um, I took three days without any food, and I, and I went and just spent these, these days kind of in, in nature and really, um, and I met this incredible bear up there on the way down. And that was, that was really um, a kind of amazing experience for me just to be uh, completely in nature. And so but, it's kind of been like my church, even though I do go to church. Yeah. Like, but what like, inspired the you? The mountains are really kind of to do that for a kid. To, I mean, a lot of kids they they would never think of. Well, I'm going to go off on a vision quest for three days and not eat any food. I mean, I, I don't know what inspired me. We we didn't have cell phones yeah. back then, so um, we didn't have that distraction. Um, but I I just felt called to go up there and do that. And and so I guess to this day I I. Tr I, I spend a lot of time in the San Gabriels, and mm -hmm. um, I really um, appreciate and honor what that does for our soul and, and, and our, um, our health, actually, our well-being. It's, it's really important, that, and I think the more we are um, disconnected, we always talk about connections with technology, yeah. And how we're like connected here and connected there, and you know, I can always be online and check this and, and yeah, check my social this, media. that and f feed, you know, and and but in that process, we're actually disconnecting from something very uh, important, and that is, you know, human beings, and and nature, and we're a part of nature. So, as we dis as, as as we disconnect from that. Thing which we have a human element for so many, you know, tens of thousands of years, um, by connecting with technology, and I'm not anti-technology, but I just believe that that we need to bring the balance back, and and so that's helped me like really think about okay, what are we doing on a on a global level and and a community level uh, to bring the equilibrium and the balance back to our um, to our collective planetary yeah. existence. Well, I think a lot of us recognize the value of 
human connection or the value mm -hmm. of uh, connection to nature. And I, I know um, many of my friends, family members, yeah. they'll go on hikes or they'll go camping or they'll be out yeah. in nature. Or they'll, they'll go to a park, for example. Um, they'll be in the ocean. Yeah. Um, but how do we as a society and actually now as a global culture because technology is pervasive wherever you yeah. go, how do we then um, kind of change our thinking uh, as human beings mm -hmm. around what we're missing? Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're missing as far as uh, human connection, human touch, um, human interaction, conversation, and then this, this um, a little bit larger notion of um, being in tune with nature, actually, you know, smelling the roses and yeah. then, or, um, you know, touching the trees when we yeah. walk past them. Uh, yeah. how, how do we change that? Um, I think to start, we have to slow down because we've gotten to a point in our culture where we we have this kind of greed of experience. Like, we want to uh, stuff so much experience and um, yeah. it's, it's, it's like we're hungry all the time for, for variety, yeah. you know? And, and so we can't mm. slow down enough to really uh, be mindful of, uh, of the miracles all around us, you know? The, the, the miracles of, of, of a tree in our yard or, or a stream by our house. Mm. Um, or a hummingbird in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, just the, the, the conditions that, that, that have to be for that thing to happen are, are, are really miraculous if you think about it. Um, and so just our breath, so many things we can be aware of um, which mm. will allow us to, um, to just slow down and, and be aware and appreciate uh, all we have. You know, we, we're... we're we live on a privileged planet, extremely privileged. I mean, we, we look out into the cosmos and it's like, where is there a place like this, you know? Yeah, kind of hard to find. It's hard to find. And then we live in a society which is extremely privileged. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as, as you and I, as white males, we have another whole level of political privilege, economic yeah. privilege. So, um, so it's, uh, it's very important to be aware aware of those things and then to, as we interface and try to build community with others, to really address these issues and be, and be uh, cognizant of the value of planting the seeds which can manifest in this kind of consciousness and awareness to spread. Mm -hmm. Because um, we're living in an, a hyper-individualized mm. um, time. Yeah. and culture, especially in America, um, where we have this almost like sacred uh, idea of, of the individual, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you touched on so many really, really critical points and really interesting ones. Um, so building community and then the whole notion of individualism or independence, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I talk a lot about in my mm -hmm. work too. Um, and one of the other ones which is so true, which I wish people would pay more attention to, is we're so consumed with quantity mm. as opposed to quality. So it's yeah. how, much, how much can I, you know, can I binge watch, you know, all of um, uh, yeah. Six Feet Under, you know, uh, over the weekend, or can yeah. I, you know... 10,000 songs in my phone. Yeah, you yeah. Know, or, how many of them do I Or really 10,000 photographs. To? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, it's true. So we're all about um, trying to squeeze as much as we can into um, yeah. the bandwidth that we have. Yeah. And so many people I know, and this gets into the, the community engagement part, but so many people I know just don't have time to even have dinner or coffee right. with you because, you know, and then you have to schedule it out like a month or two or yeah. three because they're their agendas are so yeah. full. But you stop by their house and they're like, you didn't call me. <laughs> Oh, can't, sorry. I thought this was a. Can't, can't we just come I over? Thought we were just friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, talk to me a little bit about how. What are because you've you've got some things going on like the Soul Force Music mm. Festival. So, how do activities like that and some of the other ones you're working on build community? How do they build yeah. 
relationships so that we really care about each other because it, it feels like until we get to that point we won't make time for each other exactly uh, I think you've touched upon something that is really uh, dear to my heart and my work and that it has to do with the whole slow movement mm -hmm. slow food or I don't know there's other slow movements that besides just eating together and people taking time to like you mentioned have dinner together and have a conversation uh, and develop ideas and uh, share values um, but this idea of, of, of taking the time and building community is so uh, crucial to our future I believe because without it we're gonna get stuck in um, our own desires and needs to the point where we have blinders of what what others need or what our community needs or what our planet needs and so uh, since it was uh, 1993 we I organized the first world music festival called Splang in, <laughs> in Farnsworth Park in Altadena and it was a world music festival and where people could come in. because... Schplang um, is an onomatopoeic word for the sound of different musical cultures coming to, together in one huh? place. Schplang. So that was, the, <laughs> that was the idea. I was still in college at CalArts. Mm. And so and I was inspired by the sound of Javanese gamelan, which is a lot of... Is that like, drums? It, it's, it has drums, but it has a lot of metallophones. Oh, like, okay. Uh, kind of um, like xylophones, but, but, uh, but bigger and d different sizes and oh, made of there's metal. There's Caribbean music like that too, isn't there? Uh, well, well, the pan music from the Caribbean is, is, is made on, um, made on the, the old gas uh, oil cans, yeah. but this is, these, this is very different. This is, this is like an orchestra percussion instrument. Anyway, I studied that music at CalArts and it, it, it just gave me this idea for Schplang, which was kind of the first series of music concerts I started producing in mm. the Pasadena area. And uh, we had African and Indian music and Vietnamese music and Indonesian music. Uh, and so I, I kind of became this evangelist for world music to, to, to give people this idea of valuing our diversity through musical culture. And I started to realize that, you know, for people to enjoy this, they really have to like, number one, sit down and pay attention and slow down. Yeah. Because um, anytime, it's like that old adage, people don't know what they like, they like what they know. Yeah, so, what's comfortable. Yeah, so it's, uh, and it happens a lot with music and art, and same as food, is, is people don't really want to necessarily experience something new, have a new taste or a flavor or a new experience, but they get stuck on what they yeah. already like. Yeah, because it's it's unknown familiar. to them. Yeah. yeah, it's not familiar. Yeah. True. So, um, so that was something that I think uh, kind of broadens people's aesthetic appreciation, and also brings people together of different different cultures and, and, and races and, and ethnic backgrounds. So, and and religious faiths or non-religious, you know, uh, spiritual paths or whatever you want to call it. So, that was something that. Uh, I started to do, and then we did a, another concert with uh, and at the Memorial Park Band Shell when it right. was all run old, down. In old past Yeah, I had to get yeah. special permission because it was not being used at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and we had uh, Indian music, and we actually had the f first, I think the first concert of Oza Motley when they took that name. Because they they, I went to college with those guys and played on their first record. And, and they were, <laughs> this is a funny story, they were at that time trying to decide between the name Somos Marcos <laughs> and Oza Motley. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's uh, a slight difference. Yeah, yeah. So they chose uh, Oza Motley, and that was, I think, the first concert in the band shell. That was like 84, 85, when they, you started using that name. And we're going to, um, I was actually talking to Jiro, we're going to do a little retrospective recording of one of the first songs on their original first album which came out a couple years sure. later. So but just to push on this notion mm -hmm. a little bit, how does a, a music festival or a music concert or, or music um, convening or bringing together all of those, and, and I think it's fantastic to have this notion of world music yeah. so that then we are, we are forced <coughs> to sit with the sitar or yeah. with the 
Java and drums. Yeah. But how does that build community? Because oftentimes we just go to a concert or to a play or some other um, artistic activity or even a museum, yeah. but then we go back to our lives. Yeah. Where's the kind of the, the long-term impact? Yeah. Good question. Well, I think initially is with this kind of a, a festival like the Soul Force Festival, which we just, we just did in Pasadena um, in April. And we had, uh, for instance, Moroccan Ganawa music, which is a trance music that, uh, uh, from Morocco. We had Kowali, Pakistani Sufi music. We had Indian Drupad music, which is one of the oldest spiritual traditions uh, in Indian classical music. Uh, we had Filipino shamanic chanting with a wonderful artist from uh, from Mindanao, mm -hmm. um, and then <clears throat> so and then we had uh, Dwight Tribble with my group doing a kind of mixture of raga jazz and kind of uh, spiritual jazz, and what else? We had uh, Hawaiian music, so and everything was based upon sacred sacred traditions. So um, this was this kind of a uh, environment where you have people coming this is what generally happens is with a, with a festival we have all this kind of diversity people usually come for one of those things or maybe two and then they stay and then they're exposed to the stuff they've never heard right and so what happens is people start uh, making new connections making new friends people from other cultures learning asking people oh, what, is, what is it about this and and, and discussing yeah. and having um, uh, dialogue with people and I think that is a very powerful community building tool it's because you you are you have people who like we're talking about comfort zone so you have people who are like oh I love koala music for instance you know Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan this great koala singer who I know and then and then they're hearing this Filipino music and they're like wow that's really cool I've never experienced that before and there's so much uh, emotion so much depth to this um, so they may talk to a Filipino there who's in the kind of reverse mm -hmm. position who they know this but they don't know the koala music so just to um, think about this mm -hmm. a little bit differently so there's no like formal mixing mechanism so it's not like mm -mm. there's an agenda and then people go through like when you go to um, a community organizing meeting or a um, an organizing session especially mm -hmm. in a political realm yeah there are all these activities or processes that you go through to try to bring people together and um, help them to connect with one another. This sounds much more, pardon the phrase, organic in the sense mm -hmm. that um, you just leave it up to the individuals to bond uh, over common interest or, um, or the curiosity that they have. And then, then they, then maybe it sort of um, spirals out from there yeah. and then you let them connect later on is that kind of the that's way that's part of it I think <clears throat> that the other part of it that's important which is a little more uh, built into the intentionality of what we're doing mm -hmm. is that we include speakers so uh, for instance we had a woman uh, a Pakistani woman t speaking about the nonviolent legacy of uh, Abdul ba uh, um, Bacha Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who was uh, a nonviolent revolutionary who worked alongside Gandhi oh, okay. in India, but mm -hmm. but most 99% of people don't have never heard his name. Right. So, and he actually raised up a army of some 80,000 nonviolent soldiers. They were called the Red Shirts, Red Shirts in the um, the Frontier Province, which is now Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So you could say these were this was pre-partition. So there was, it, this was all British India, but they were fighting nonviolently against the British with uniforms, but no weapons. And eighty thousand of them—that's an enormous. It's, it's incredible history. Army of peace. It, it's incredible history that uh, so, uh, so many people don't uh, know. Yeah. And um, so this woman was talking about that legacy, and because I went to Pakistan last year for the first time. I've been to India six times, but this was the first time to tour around Pakistan and perform uh, in Karachi, Islamabad, and Lahore. And just connecting with the people there, um, there's so much bad media press about Pakistan, 
that we that we're exposed to right. you know is this uh, islamist fundamentalists um you know violence blah 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 right and uh i felt so safe and so uh, appreciated when i was there you know and and people were asking me oh were you afraid to come to pakistan and i said you know uh this was in march of last year a year ago and i said you know we've had 11 school shootings in my country just in the past couple of months. Three months, months. Yeah. yeah. So I don't feel that your country is more violent than mine. Um, we have uh, we have our vanilla ISIS over here, you right. know, with the white supremacy and, and all that. It's the same thing. I say, okay, you have your problems in this country. You have uh, mm. Islamic uh, extremists. Who, uh, I and mean, that's a real problem in Pakistan, obviously. Yeah. So uh, we small. have our problem here. It's a very small percentage of the mm. population uh, causing this problem, as we have our own problems here with, uh, with racism and uh, intolerance. So it was really cool to be able to share that in Pakistan, with, with, even with the media, because I was, I was performing on uh, major stages, and, 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 and people were asking me, like, because not a lot of Americans go to Pakistan. No. In, in reality, it's, it's kind of rare. Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, and I, it's just so fascinating to talk to you. I wish we had um, another yeah. half an hour, two or three. Um, but just to kind of wrap up, what are your what are your thoughts about? I, I, it seems like what you've done is created harmony, and uh, uh, harmony not only musically but also socially, especially seeing mm -hmm. other people for who they are. What would you want to leave our audience with mm -hmm. um, today? within that um, theme? Well, I think uh, as human beings, we really need to value openness to, to being with people who are different from us. Yeah. And that's one of the main, um, you could say, values of the Soul Force Project. So it's a project I've been doing for five years now. We've produced uh, events around Los Angeles. The first was at Occidental College. Um, and then we just had an event um, around the corner from here at the First United Methodist Church, the Soul Force Festival. So um, we're really looking for people to get involved. And uh, you can do that at soulforceproject.com or email us at soulforceproject at gmail. Uh, but really, the values we're trying to promote is uh, looking at the value of our diversity and our ability to inspire change making through uh, realizing that we're all in this together. We may have, you know, 10,000 different languages and cultures and races uh, on this planet, but we're all in this together. We, we, we don't have a planet B, as, as, as people right. are talking about. The, the, this is, we're going to sink or swim. Yeah, this and, is it. And, and so one of the values of Soul Force Projects is use the music to inspire people into community work and activism. I love the work you're doing, and I want to thank you so much for being here today. It was really, really a pleasure to get to talk to you a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, so, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you. It. All right, great to be here. All right. Usually, 